Welcome to season two of the Beyond Disability podcast by Dorset Orthopaedic, where we will be hearing from just some of our incredible patients. They'll be sharing with us their journeys through life and rehabilitation, including all the highs and lows. Make sure to click follow to never miss an episode and enjoy. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Mike Wildman. Uh, it's my great pleasure and honor to be uh, hosting this podcast today, Beyond Disability. Uh, today, I'll be uh, giving a background into my aviation history um, and uh, my piloting history uh, following disability, uh, introducing you to a good friend of mine, Luke Sinek, who's had a very different journey um, and uh, is doing some uh, very interesting projects. We'll both talk about uh, how we've faced up to the challenges to disability uh, and allowed ourselves to get back into um, flying as uh, both a, from a professional point of view, uh, from a motivational point of view, uh, and a rehabilitation point of view. So, um, and at the end, I think we're going to take some questions. So, first of all, that is my great um, pleasure to introduce you to to Luke. Um, Luke, if you say a bit about yourself, and then I'll come back and give a bit about my history. That's that. Yeah, sure. Hi, Mike. Um, yeah, so Luke's in it. I'm uh, ex army. Uh, double above the amputee, so I was injured uh, back in 2010, November 2010. Uh, so I've been an amputee quite a while now, um, and uh, I'm a pilot. I've been flying pretty much since uh, the moment they let me out of hospital, and uh, someone was willing to let me near an aircraft. Uh, I also do a bit of long jumping for GP on the side uh, and work with a, a host of charity. Now, my wife, you think you're you're um, hoping to undertake professional flying as well. I'm hoping to take flying to the, I would like to say the pinnacle where you can take it, which is, yeah, making it, making it your, um, not only your passion, but your, your income, you know, way of making a limit. So I think that's, that's taking flying to the, the actual limits where you can take it. Uh, sure. Becoming an astronaut, I suppose. Maybe they're the, the rock stars of the flying world. I don't know. I just see that EASA had its uh, disabled um, astronaut, Skiing, um, I don't know if you saw that. Uh, they chose four people last year, but they had to be under forty, which I didn't quite uh, didn't quite make the uh, the bar for that. <laughs> so, so, so um, I'll, I'll just say a little bit about myself then. Uh, so, Mike Wildman, uh, uh, I've been flying since I was about eighteen. Got my PPL. Uh, joined the Royal Air Force. Uh, I was in the Air Force for twelve years, doing um, tactical C one hundred and thirty operational flying, both with the Royal Air Force and uh, with the Belgian Air Force on exchange, so, so, so quite a lot of unusual um, flying down in Africa and the Gulf and various bits and pieces. Um, 27 or 28 years ago now, I joined Virgin Atlantic, which I did effectively up until my amputation, which was seven years ago, um, uh, following a motorcycle accident. Uh, my story is similar to Luke, is uh, I got back uh, into a light aircraft as soon as I had my prosthetic, effectively. Um, there's a great charity called Airability. If anybody uh, um, would like to get involved in disabled flying or support disabled flying as a sponsor, um, it's a fantastic charity in um, Blackbush. Uh, they got me back into a, 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 a um, PA-28 light aircraft which had uh, um, controls that had been uh, uh, adapted for um, uh, MC flying. And I was flying, I think, six weeks after my operation. I was, I was back in the air. Um, in a similar situation, I think, I think to Luke, I was very fortunate. Uh, just at the time I'd had my operation, um, the Douglas Bader Foundation um, wanted to create the world's first disabled air display team. It hadn't really been done before. There's a couple of guys um, and a, a, out in Italy who have done some flying with a, a, a able-bodied, um, but this was going to be the world's first fully disabled air display team. And so it was a joint project between the um, Bader Foundation, who provide the money and air ability who provided the expertise and I think we took about 15 uh, disabled pilots went through a selection procedure I was lucky enough to get chosen with two other guys um, and we did two years of training uh, supplied by uh, some really great ex uh, Warbird and display pilots and we got to the stage where I think we did six air displays um, in the 2019 air display season and uh, it was pretty cool um, the problem with it really was that the uh, the aircraft we used were PA-28s, which were training aircraft from 
um, their ability, which meant they weren't particularly dynamic. So the show was good. We did very tight formation, and it was proved that disabled people had the capability to fly a very close formation uh, and and uh, to the standard to, to display in front of the public. But um, it wasn't exactly dynamic. And so uh, COVID came around, uh, sitting on the ground for a year or two, and I decided that uh, we'd try and take it to the next level. And uh, we can add uh, a, a fully aerobatic air display team, which is uh, Team Phoenix um, was created uh, for myself and one of the pilots from uh, the Bada Foundation. Um, was uh, uh, chosen and we uh, uh, did our training to uh, to try and uh, do shows for um, for disabled, but with uh, fully um, aerobatic uh, maneuvers in Russian uh, fighter airplanes. So that's kind of where we are um, at the moment. Very lucky to be uh, sponsored by both uh, Douglas Barda Foundation, by Dorset Orthopedic, who sponsored us through both streams so far, which has been fantastic. Um, Blessma, who are the um, the Limbus uh, uh, service charity, um, and uh, we're also sponsored by Marshalls of Cambridge, which is a big uh, aerospace industry. So um, we've had a lot of help um, through it all. And uh, it's in a bit of an abeyance at the moment because of the Ukraine war. My, uh, my wingman is a, uh, an engineer in the Air Force. It's not easy for him to get that time off. So we're, we're kind of standing still with it at the moment. Uh, in the meantime, um, I'm an, an examiner and uh, instructor on Airbus aircraft, and that's what I do uh, with my time. I teach and um, um, examine pilots uh, through their six monthly uh, assessment checks. Um, but I look like I may well be going back to fly jets again myself. So um, that's kind of in abeyance at the moment. I hope I'll, I'll know in the next few days whether I'm able to go back and um, fly large, uh, long lower planes again. So that's me. Were you flying before your um, your amputation? Uh, a little bit. I mean, I so I I've always been fascinated with flight, but I I'd only sort of done things like paragliding, uh, done a little bit of gliders and stuff, uh, but never really took it took it forward as a career. And I I joined the army. I think really when I look back, I joined the army because I was very interested in the Apache, and that's something you could only do in the army. Uh, so I that was an you know, I think you went in there with your eyes open going, right, it's a lot of people trying to fly Apache. And I think of an intake of 300 officers, at least 150 of them were, were, were gunning for that. So it's quite high, um, quite high failure rate to get there. And I got down to the last 11 uh, and uh, missed out. That's what I was like. I was number 11 of the 11 that they took forward. So uh, I, I ended up commissioned into the Royal Engineers and just sort of, you just had to let that one go. Uh, after a couple of years in in the army, uh, serving as a you know frontline officer, I sort of the passion was still there, and I, I reapplied. And I said, because you could do, you could swap cap badges, you could move around once you're once you're in the army, once you're in the land forces. So I I made the application, and they accepted me on the second run. So I passed all my testing and stuff, all the grading and things you go through, uh, and I was deployed. I had obviously, you know, at the time we were fighting Iraq and Afghanistan at the same time. So you, you were quite regularly turning around on a tour plot. And I had Afghanistan tour to get through. And when I got back from that, I was going to start my pilot training. Um, however, I've been deployed in quite a punchy role in the counter ID search teams uh, as a researcher, leading a, a team of searchers uh, to remove what back then in, during Herrick 13 when I was out there was a pretty massive threat. It was pretty much everywhere. Unfortunately, sorry, can you just well, sorry? Like, can you just a uh, research? I mean, people don't know what that is. You just did a bit. A research is a uh, sorry, yeah, it's a Royal Engineer Search Advisor. So, effectively, um, you plan and conduct and then execute uh, search operations looking for uh, well, bobs and devices like that. I mean, they come in various forms, but we do UK and overseas operations where we're basically counter terrorist teams. Uh, looking for were you were you very on this postal as well we didn't know i was doing so i was search so uh we didn't like to mix the two so you were either searching or you were destroying the devices or removing the devices so we didn't we didn't like to mix the two so we had two separate um operators there one there to find it one there to get rid of it and um, we had our teams working with us 
Uh, but on operations, you know, where you're dealing with, you know, in the UK, obviously we go in, if we had, if, if the device was suspected, it'd be a massive operation with, you know, all focused on this one device. On operations like in Afghanistan, you're sort of wandering around finding them everywhere. Um, so it becomes a bit more, you can become, I wouldn't say you become blase, but it, you know, you just sort of, you expect it to just be everywhere. Uh, and every step is quite, you know, is threatening because you're going into places where you know there's a lot of them. Uh, anyway, I, I got the bad news. Uh, unfortunately, halfway through the tour, the vice functioned and, and took my legs. And uh, you know, to, to 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 add insult to injury, I got my uh, I got a disciplinary reaction for not turning up for my first day of training on helicopters. So, I mean, obviously, no one, no one went forward with it. They realised what happened. It's just the administration machine had taken over. But it, that was sort of like the uh, for me that was a real kick up the butt to think, well, you know. Is is this out question for me? Can I not fly anymore? I mean, do are legs that important? And and I suppose like most people that overnight you find yourself disabled, you'd never really looked at this stuff. You know, you sort of suddenly you're in this whole new world and you you've got to start looking to see what's possible. Uh and ten years ago, airability were there. Uh and so my first flight was with airability and yeah, it was amazing, you know, to to get back in one of the to get into these airplanes, to learn the basics, how to fly. They had all the adaptations in there so i must admit being someone that's flown for a while now learning to fly with just your hands alone that is tough that is really tough you're trying to control the throttle control the yoke and control the rudder all all with your hands and you know by my by my mass that's three hands you require and i do think you know i didn't have an extra hand implanted on me so i i had to make do with two so it's it's tough very tough and i i probably spent about in and out surgery, I probably spent about six months to a year trying to fly with air ability. Uh, and they were going through some big changes as well. And I, uh, and interestingly, I was sort of, I was doing it and not really w- working out where I wanted to go with this. What did I want to do with this? Did I just want to leisure fly? Did I want to make a career out of this? And I suppose, you know, I was just thinking, let's see how this goes. Every day, every day was like another step to see as it's possible because it's, it's tough. Learning to fly is tough. It's, um, you know, it's, it's one of the most rewarding, but also one of the most stressful things you can do, I find. And, uh, you know, every day you feel like you've made progress and then you feel like you, you've just stepped back a number of few steps, you know, so it's, it's a real steep learning curve. And I, I came away from that after six months and thought this, uh, this is great. It's, it's definitely, I'm getting there, but the progress isn't going as fast as I'd like. Uh, and I, and I just haven't got the time to commit to, to the full-time training. And I think that's, one big lesson I took away from that is that if you are going to learn to fly, you've got to make that a very high priority in your life. You can't do it as like a side hobby and pop down at a weekend. Hopefully the weather's good. If it's not, oh, well, never mind. I'll see you next month. You just won't make progress. And that's the way I'd approached it. Uh, so I, I sort of, uh, I had a lot of surgery going on at the time and I, and I was looking around to see, you know, what kind of fly was out there. And I, and I, I sort of, stumbled across an organization called fly for freedom who were flying uh or were in fact just starting up and were looking to fly flex wings to the south pole and uh, i don't know if anyone's ever seen a flex wing it's uh it looks like a hand glider with a buggy underneath uh there's no protection you're completely exposed to the elements so already you're looking at that thinking well the south pole isn't the warmest place on the planet um, in fact, you're looking at minus 80 chill factor. So, you know, not, not the ideal place for an exposed air cockpit. Uh, but I loved the idea of the challenge and I loved the idea of get to the South Pole. You know, most, most army officers have Shackleton sort of hammered into their skulls for 12 months while they're at Sandhurst. So all you're ever taught is that if you want to be an army officer, you've got to go to the South Pole. It's almost part of the ingrained training they give you. Uh, and so I, I thought, right, well, that ticks off quite a few things in my box to go to the South Pole and and to fly, you know, learn how to fly. And when I first got in one of these flex wings, I did I did look at it like that thing doesn't look airworthy, if I'm honest. But the moment I got in it and the acceleration taking off, the visibility, how much you could see and stuff, I was in love. I was fully in love with the way these machines operate. And I didn't look back. I just got in them, started learning how to fly. They were adapted. Um we had all the adaptations required. We had guys missing arms flying them we had myself missing legs you know we had uh guys paraplegics were flying them you know they're they very very flyable aircraft 
Uh, and I loved it. And, and I've been flying them now, coming on about nine years now. And I've, um, I've got hundreds of hours on them and I still get it in. It still makes me smile when I take off, you know, it still, still gives me the buzz factor. Uh, and you know, I, I, I think it unleashed that passion for flying. I think I was losing that a little bit when I was just sort of still trying to learn and, and get frustrated. I think once I got in there and started flying regularly and getting into the, the passion of it, that's where I thought, actually, you know what? I could, I could possibly make this career. I could take this somewhere. Uh, and I'm also looking. Uh, to hopefully one day fly for an airline or, uh, you know, maybe fly in um, uh, some sort of interesting commercial piloting. You know, I'm not, I'm not fussy. I just, I just love being up in the air. Yeah, that's a fantastic story. I mean, absolutely amazing. Uh, congratulations. Um, one thing I would say as far as flying training is concerned, a lot of guys, certainly after Iraq and uh, Afghanistan, were able to claim funding um, to get them to the kind of 50 hour stage, get that BPL. And I think it was quite disappointing from then, from then onwards, because it was so expensive to continue. And, and then to go to the next stage for a commercial license, you need 1500 hours. And so guys were getting their hopes up to get to that stage. And then suddenly they couldn't go any further. So they, 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 they'd had it as a form of rehab and wanted to go further. It was quite difficult. But I, I think now I've, I've talked to a number of people. I think you might be in the same situation where um, some of the major airlines are offering um, uh, trainee pilot scholarships to disabled people, which gives them the opportunity to go in from very low hours and go straight through the system like anybody else. Um, have you come across that? Yeah, well, I, I, I'm, I'm involved with Wings for Warriors, so that's the reason I'm in this. And they, they're the, I think they've been one of the big conduits to make this happen. Uh, they, they, over the years, they've put a few disabled guys through through commercial pilot training. Uh, put them in in touch with an airline, you know. And the guys have to pass the selection. Don't get me wrong; they're not they're not going to open the door for you and, and show you through ahead of everyone else. You know, you've got to earn your place there. But they've shown that you know there's a lot of these ex service guys with various disabilities that you know medically can fly the aircraft, and and they've taken a chance on them. And I think you know that's that's really positive. There's some good stuff going on there. Uh, I think given COVID, that they, they all took a bit of a whack, didn't it? And I think now only just now we're starting to see all these these sort of cadet programs come back again. Yeah, TUI. Tu- I got a friend of mine went through the TUI program earlier on this year, um, springtime. Um, he was unfortunate. I think he got down to the last four, but didn't quite make it. Um, these uh, schemes are out there and they can only get uh, more more uh, sort of numerous and, and sort of prevalent. So uh, for people who are thinking about it, um, yeah, get your class one uh, and get out there because uh, there are opportunities to train Zalant pilots at the moment. I think the, the airlines are are very enthusiastic, enthusiastic to get involved. Yeah, you're right. And I think the CAA are enthusiastic to get disabled people flying, you know, and I think so it's a, it's a positive landscape right now for disabled pilots. So I want to go that way. Absolutely right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll just, uh, you were saying earlier on about um, flying the PA-28 with three hands. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, Barry Hompkirk, who was the, um, uh, the, on the left wing in the, um, uh, Barter and uh, Barter's bus company, the first the first um, uh, air display team, um, was a paraplegic, so had no movement from the waist outwards as well. Um, yeah, he, yeah. he had some, he, I think he he was able to get in and out of the airplane, but he was um, he was trying to fly fly close formation. Um, uh, as you know, it's, it's really difficult because there's a lot of throttle movements required and rudder movements required. How he did it, I have absolutely no idea. And the other thing with the PA-28 is um, it's gutless. So once you get out, it's very hard to get back in. So a lot of um, anticipation and, and smooth skills required. And also it didn't have uh, an open route. So if you got out of uh, out of um, position, um, it would be necessary to break out. So I've just got to say, uh, I think Barry that year or two did an absolute fabulous job to, uh, to be flying very close formation um, uh, with with no legs, I think, is uh, is a fantastic achievement, and I'm sure you've you've been doing something sort of similar under the right lights. I know. Again, I think it's interesting to sort of push the boundaries of what disabled people can do, um, as far as fly is concerned. Um, and I think effectively, you can do anything. There's this, um, as you've you've proved as well. I don't think there's anything that we can't do, is there? No, I'm with you, Mike. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I think. Um... You know, you've got to be you got to be fit to fight with this stuff. I think um, you know you've got to look after yourself, stay fit, healthy if you're going to do these things. Because yeah, like like you said with Alan, you know, it's um, 
it's you think flying would be physically not that demanding, but because you just sat down, but it's not, uh, and you will be working hard, sweating. So you know you need to be quite fit for this stuff, um, despite what your preconceptions might be about pilots. Uh, so yeah, if you want to do this stuff, you yeah, you, you, it's all possible. Uh, and I think the prosthetic side of stuff is always getting better. You know, there's some great stuff out there. I'm flying now with my Genium X3. So I went from a, because as I said about the three hand stuff, you know, I, I don't have three hands, so it wasn't very easy to be a good pilot, try and operate with just your hands alone. So I, I adapted my legs for flying. I found a fixed leg that didn't, was, was working well in flex wings and stuff, but struggled on the bigger stuff. So I'm now using my Genium X3s, uh, fixed positions. Uh, and it and it works really well. And I think, you know, you, you fly with your eyes more than you. I'm, I'm, I'm more of a visual flyer. So I, I see what the plane's doing and I and I interpret that to my what my feet need to do. Uh, so I found that sort of, I don't need to feel the pedals. I need to see what the, what, what's happening with the pedals. And, it's, and it, seems, it seems to be working quite well. Um, so, yeah, I, you know, I, I think... Um, if you're out there embracing the technology and willing to push the boundaries, you, your flying can only get better. Um, yeah, what is it about flying that you, you know, that that gives you so much enjoyment that that you love so much? What is it about it that just uh, floats your boat? Um, I mean, I think my love of flying goes back to just yeah, the first time you sit in the back of an airplane on your way to a foreign destination. You know that excitement. Uh, now I think everyone gets everyone gets that, don't they? first time i see my kids now when i when i get an airplane with them it's almost their favorite part of holiday they're going somewhere exciting when you get there you're like oh it's just england with sunshine sometimes but you know it's uh that that buzz is i think that's in, innately in everyone except for those that fear flying like mr t uh so i i think that's always been there that that love of uh lifting off the ground and feeling about happening and i think uh that's why I was always interested in aviation. When I first got in an airplane and flew one for myself, and that first feeling, I suppose when I go back to the first time I went solo, that first yeah. time solo, you know, that that's an amazing moment. No one no one can give you that. Yeah. No one can take that away from you. That that feeling that it's you under your own steam, taking this, you know, feat of engineering and taking it straight up into the sky. Uh, I mean, it, it's one of the it was probably the most terrifying and most exhilarating experiences I ever had, and I think that that alone I, I could I could live out on that for thirty years. Uh, and I, I suppose, whenever I get an aircraft now, I still feel that excitement when it's rolling along the runway, and I'm looking for the looking for the speed to uh, rotate the controls, and off I go, you know, and then I'm free of the ground, and I. And then, you know, the big one, I mean, our charity is called Fly for Freedom for a reason. That freedom you feel when you fly, uh, you know, you've got, unlike on a road, it's two-dimensional. When you get in the sky, it's four-dimensional. You can go you can go up, you can go down, you can go left, you can go right. Uh, in some spaces, you're not allowed to go there. You're not allowed to go into those invisible barriers. It's in, in the air sometimes. But, you know, you feel like you see something over there and you go, let's go and have a look. That's that's something you can't do anywhere else with any other vehicle uh, the, under your control. So I think that freedom is a big one. That's massive. And I think freedom is and flying are the two big words for me that go together. Fantastic. Yeah, for me, I think it's very similar. And it's there's such unique experiences airborne, aren't they? You say the first time um, you go solo and you look across and the, uh, the instructor isn't there. Um yeah, the first time you get lost on a, on a Navex, the uh, uh, um, yeah, the first time, yeah, militarily f flying at low level, uh, yeah, flying at two fifty feet, the first time um, you get your command, and there's uh, yeah, you've got first officer with you for the first time, um, flying around the world. I, I used to just love looking out the window. You know, instead of school, you shouldn't look out the window the whole time. But, you know, uh, some of the views <laughs> from four thousand feet over the Sahara or over the Himalayas or uh, yeah, flying down the coast of Africa to go into Cape Town, places like that. You just can't believe those things until you've had a chance to see it and do it. The same as this, the, the opportunity that you've got of flying these uh, these um, uh, flexoring microlites in formation down to somewhere like Gibraltar. That's the sort of thing 
Uh, you'll never get another opportunity to do that. You know, it's going to be a one-off and it's such an amazing thing to do. Um, and we're just so lucky to, to, to have the opportunity to do these things. Um, and I know that um, Hannah was asking me about why, why I set up the Ed splitting second one. And it was really to, you know, to prove that, you know, we guys and girls, um, we don't have any restrictions. We don't have anything that we can't do. We can go and loop and roll in close formation. We can fly these airplanes to, to obscure places. We can um, you know, land big jets at night in bad weather. We can do all these things. Um, and and as things go forwards, the disabled people are going to be able to, uh, to do these uh, more and more, I think. I don't know how you feel about it. No, I agree, and and uh, you know what you you have qualities that are important in a pilot, which is this sort of you don't give up, you can't give up, you know you can't you can't accept the fact that these conditions are too bad and I can't fly this plane, and I think that that mentality is really important in a pilot. And I think when they're when airlines are looking for people to be pilots, they're really interested in those qualities that you bring. They're not they're not so much interested in you know how well you can fly an airplane. They're more interested in your ability to command an aircraft, to, to deal with the good times and the bad times the same way that you, you deal with things on the ground. And I think don't underestimate the disabled person's ability to do that. You know, they've had a, whether they were born from childhood with these disabilities or they've acquired them later in life, there's definitely a tenacity that you get uh, out of dealing with these situations that, that feeds perfectly into being a pilot. Uh, you know, whether you take it commercially or just do it for leisure, climb will challenge you just like being disabled challenges you. And just like you, you sort of command your disability, you'll command that aeroplane and you'll, you'll get it down and you'll navigate it sagely just like you navigate your disability safe. Absolutely. And I think I had a, an interview yesterday and, and the people on the interview board were more interested in talking about my disabilities and, and the things that I'd done since I'd lost my leg. Uh, than they were about you know, my entire you know, uh, 25 or 40 years of flying before, you know, 35 years of flying before I've done that. Um, so, yeah, I, and I, one thing I would say is that losing a limb can be an opportunity for you. And certainly for me, um, obviously it was later in life for me. I, I, I had a profession as a pilot by that stage. But some of the things that I've done, being ambassadors for charities or, or flying for the air display things, uh, teams, I would never have had the opportunity to do those things if I hadn't been unfortunate and lost a limb. So sometimes it can be overwhelming and um, uh, seem like, yeah, obviously a very, very bad thing has happened to you, but, but opportunities will always come, I find. And, and you've proved that yourself. I mean, remarkably, you're now an international athlete and a pilot and possibly going to have a career as a pilot. I mean, that's just amazing, isn't it? So, yeah. And I, and I I think you've got to be prepared to fail at this stuff as well. Yeah. So, you know, there's always a way to do it. There is always a way to do it. It's whether or not people are willing to wait while you work it out. Uh, and and there's, the, as long as you've got the tenacity and you, you've got the passion to keep pushing it, people are willing to wait. Um, but don't be afraid to fail. I, I, I have failed at many things since being disabled and before being disabled, to be honest. And I think you've got to, you just got to take that in your stride. Uh, try again. If needs be, we'll find a different avenue to investigate. And I, that's how I've approached this flying. I've, every step of the way, I've been prepared that this might not work. This might might fail, and and I'll I'll have to stop and try something else, or or even give up flying. But the journey's still going. The dream's still alive, and and I'll I'll hold on to it as long as I can. Absolutely, and I I feel exactly the same. I've been flying since I was eighteen. I'm sixty one there, and I still fight, feel as excited about flying. Uh, as I did when I started, it just it's just never gone away from me. Um, and even the commercial airlines doing the walk around, and walking out a big jet and knowing that you're going to strap it on and take it halfway around the world, uh, it's still exciting when you you know uh, as it ever was when I started. And I think that's you know that's the great thing about flying is it never actually stops being uh, fantastic. And I'm sure you feel the same. Now I've got some questions come through. Yeah. Luke, can someone go as an upper limb amputee fly a plane? Well, I know that Alan. Um, who was in the splitting with me, was that for amputee. Um, there's also yeah. a fantastic guy called Steve, what's his seven then? Um, he flies aerobatics in his aircraft. Steve Robinson, I think it is, um, who's an upper arm amputee uh, and, and does uh, aerobatics. And he's involved in the um, BADA uh, um, disability scheme and uh, through that. And I met him last year. So 
yes, I don't think there's a problem. Obviously, it depends which arm it is. Um, uh, there's always going to be a way around it. But obviously, what tends to happen is you fly with your good arm on the control column, and then you clamp your uh, prosthetic onto the um, thrust lever, I think is the way to do it. Um, uh, have you come across that at all? I have, yeah, I've seen, I mean, flex wings are predominantly, you do need two arms, but I've seen one arm people fly them a couple of times. Uh, and I think, I think with, with a, with an arm amputation, I think there's got to be some adaptation to the aircraft predominantly. There probably does need to be a little bit of adaptation. So I think, you know, for going commercial, it's been done. Don't get me wrong. If you want to be a commercial pilot, it has been done, but you need a very good arm. A really good arm, good fitting arm. You know, there's there's less wiggle room with arms over legs. I find just because the arms are so busy uh, when you're flying. Uh, so I think you know, I would I would I wouldn't not rule it out as a possibility. And I think you'd always find a way because that's that's what disabled people do. I think embrace the technology, like I've said before. Uh, make make sure you know if get the latest best arm get an arm that has a very low failure rate because that's another thing that CAA will look at that you've got a limb that's that's got a very good track record because the last thing you want is an arm doing its own thing while you're flying uh, and I think you know be prepared to get out of there uh, make some mistakes obviously safe mistakes make some mistakes on, on your prosthesis try things that work well on one aircraft might not work well on another one and eventually you'll come up with a toolkit that means you can fly anything yeah, I think you're right. Um, the good news in this case is that this is a path that's already been trodden. So you know, you're not being the first person trying to prove this thing because somebody's out there and made a career doing it. So it's, it's definitely doable yeah. because it's been done. Um, my experience with the CAA, again, with prosthetics is that they prefer your prosthetics to be as simple as possible. So you don't want anything with you know, bionic or that's got any electrical movement or anything because that's something that can go wrong you know, at a critical phase. So they much prefer you to have um, as, as simple prosthetics as possible. Okay. Um, have you ever had anything go wrong whilst flying? There we go. <laughs> uh, yeah. what, do you want me to start on that one, Martin? Do you want it? Yeah, you, well, I, well I get that. Um, I've, I've been reasonably lucky. I've had a, a couple of uh, engine failures. I've been going through fast jet flying. I managed to flame out a walk twice in about two months. Um, one my fault and one the other, uh, one, one, one that wasn't, um, really challenging to eventually, uh, thankfully I managed to get the, uh, the, um, uh, engine relit and didn't have to eject. Um, I've lost a few engines from time to time, um, been shot at a few times and sort of mortared on the ground. Uh, I had a complete double hydraulic failure in an A340 once, uh, going into JFK. So a few things, but nothing too major. How about you? Uh, I've been I've been quite fortunate. I've not had any um, engine failures. Touch wood. Um, I've had a I've had a prop wrap. Uh, there was a loose strap somewhere in the aircraft, and it flew into the prop and wrapped the prop. Um, but it was unbeknown to me, I heard the bang. I thought it was like a bird strike or something. Uh, and then when I got down with the engine running, realised it had a big cargo strap wrapped around it. So um, that was quite a fortunate near miss. Uh, but yeah, on the whole, no, I've, I've been I've been quite lucky. And I think the aircraft are engineering wise and the CAA regulations. I think they're a lot better. I think you get a lot less failures now than you used to twenty years right. ago. Uh, yeah. And I think I think you know you, you could be flying an aircraft that's fifty, sixty years old, but you can guarantee that a lot of it, a lot of the bits of it are brand new, uh, particularly around the engine. And they, these things get checked regularly, you know. So I'd. I'd be quite confident going up in a lot of aircraft that you know have been serviced properly that, that you, you're going to have a good flight. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so Luke, one more question that we've had uh, from sort of interested punters is, is um, uh, what would be the first steps to try flying as as a, um, an amputee with disabled class? Uh, so, right, first steps, start flying. I, I mean, I think trial flights your best step because the first thing you want to check is whether or not it's for you um it's a big commitment and i've had people turn up they want to learn how to fly uh and they've gone straight into training program and it's quite an expensive thing to do and then about four hours in they realize it's not for them so get get out there and have a trial flight first i think that's the first step um 
being a disabled pilot actually is a lot easier than being just mainstream trying to learn how to fly because you've got people like Air Ability out there. There's my organization, Fly for Freedom. I mean, that is ex-military disabled, but there are non-military disabled flyer schools like the Scholarship for Disabled Flyers, I believe it is, those lines. So there's lots of good organizations out there that will make it really affordable. Um, but I, I think the first step's got to be a trial flight. You can do that anywhere. You don't you don't need to go to a disabled flying school and have a trial flight. You can get an aircraft. Whatever your disability, most instructors are quite happy to get you in the aircraft and give you a go and let you have a go at doing the controls you can do in that aircraft. Uh, and then if it is something that you think this is this is this is something I can't not pursue. Then, then start making your applications to the disabled flying charities out there because that's definitely the best way to go if you've got a disability. Um, if you've got one, a physical disability that requires adaptation, then you've got to go to a disabled flying school because they're the only ones. Yeah, I think I'd agree with that. That's a really good advice. And from our experience, obviously, both of us ended up going to air ability. So if you're based in the south of England, um, air ability is uh, black, which is near Farnborough. Um, uh, and they're absolutely fantastic there. They've got uh, very experienced instructors. Um, they've got a simulator, two or three different types of airplanes. So um, if you can get to them, then I would say that would be um, your first port of call um, and then see where you go from there. So, well, I hope that's been um, useful and you've got some, uh, some good information out of that. Um, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. I'm, I'm sure that Luke has as well. That's pretty much the end of the podcast for today. And I'd like to, to thank Dorsal Orthopedic for uh, setting this up and also all the support that they've given me personally over the last probably nearly 10 years or so. So, um, yeah, thank you very much to them. Uh, I'd like to thank Luke very much for giving up his time and um, I'm really interesting to hear about your background and everything that you've done. Um, so thanks very much for that. And I'll, I'll turn over to Luke to say uh, to say goodbye. Yeah, <laughs> thanks, Mike. Yeah, and it's been good chatting with you. Uh, and thank you, Dorsal Orthopedic, for all the support. I uh, hopefully uh, we'll uh, be chatting at some point, maybe about long jump blades. I don't know, but um, you know, I hopefully in a couple of years' time, we'll be talking about commercial flying and how great it is. That's the that's the hope of this journey. But yeah, thanks, Mike. Good luck with all your flying.